These 25 massive miracles of masonry represent one of the basic assets of a university. They provide classrooms for the daily meeting of teacher and student. And they enclose laboratories, libraries, auditoriums, and offices for the further pursuance of scholastic attainment. Invariably, they are substantially constructed of ageless masonry and steel for the ample reason that they must serve the next generation as they have served the past. Similarly, the educators, the scientists, the administrators, the men and women whose combined efforts make the whole thing tick, they too are not a transient thing. A faculty is the product of years of combined, integrated, cohesive endeavor. It accounts for the academic integrity of the institution and represents another basic asset. Close to the campus is a group of houses representing the various Greek letter fraternities. These are permitted, in fact encouraged, because collectively they tend to nurture the social development of the student body. And in a broad sense, they are custodians of the thing we call tradition. Altogether, this is a good and desirable arrangement. So much so, in fact, that students come from China, from India, yes, from the far corners of the earth, to study here, to make lifetime friendships and associations, and perhaps to see and feel for the first time the full, clean beauty of a campus dressed in shimmering snow. Such is the picture of an American university in normal times. But what becomes of it all in time of war? This film, made on the campus of Syracuse University in the years following Pearl Harbor, is intended to be a picture record of such an institution in the service of Uncle Sam. Previous enrollment, 4,000. And now suddenly, 8,000. To sleep these men, we took over every available house near the campus. We fed them in three large mess halls. This one used to be the college commons, but we put a bigger kettle on the fire and found we could feed 1,400 in this one alone. And quick to seize the opportunity, the College of Home Economics placed its girls in the kitchen and behind the counter. This combination of classroom theory and practical experience is the goal of progressive educators the world over. college place to hold retreat. The city refused. It's a public thoroughfare, they said. You can't shut off college place. But we did. And then we took the seats out of Slocum Theater and turned it over to the army. Business ad students for generations have listened to visiting lecturers in this stately hall. But Syracuse University had now become a post of the United States Army and had thus to provide a post exchange. The first reviews were held on the old oval before the library. Here on the library steps is the commanding officer and his adjutant. And there's the girlfriend, mother and dad, maybe even the wife and kids. There were 2,100 cadets on the campus at the time, but Uncle Sam sent us another thousand and sent some more. We outgrew the old oval and moved on to Hendricks Field. We couldn't help feeling somehow, as we looked out over this vast ribbon of marching men, that now indeed, we were in the war in a big way. We soon became accustomed to soldiers on the campus. We noticed that our professors were a little busier and considerably more plentiful. Now, what about the things we are asked to teach? 
Some, like geography, had been in the curriculum for years. These subjects could be taught without change, except for an occasional GI twist. Others, like camouflage, are born of the times. But camouflage fits logically in the Department of Architecture, whose model shop, instructors, and experience are all definitely in the right groove. And two, there were many new courses, designed particularly for the men in pre-flight training. Typical is this course in medical aid. Many of the men in this picture have by now faced the brutal emergency where life and death hinge upon having this lesson well learned. Perhaps the busiest buildings on the campus were those devoted to science and engineering. In a technological war, it is axiomatic that such equipment and personnel should be of the utmost value. Pratt and Whitney sent us these girls, followed by another group every six weeks, with the request that we make technicians of them and do it in a hurry. In our materials testing laboratory, we taught them to operate the giant testing machines. And they returned to Pratt & Whitney, able to do a man-sized job. Many important discoveries have come from laboratories like these. Here a research man is oxidizing glucose with nitric acid. Yes, he's rearranging atoms, and with the greatest of ease. So what you say? So that we may retain our supremacy in the field of science, thus to guarantee success in war and to enhance the tranquil graciousness of peace. Here's another new one in the college curriculum. It's called photogrammetry. It involves the production of topographic maps from aerial photographs. It's an exact science. Its tools are complicated and costly. Its accomplishments are fantastic. The same thing is true of electronics, the basis of most military intelligence. Without it, there would be no television, no radio, no talking pictures. As scientific knowledge grows, we must keep one finger in the winds, one ear to the ground. We used to teach physics in terms of Sir Isaac Newton's famous session under the apple tree. Yes, we taught that air had mass, but no one particularly cared. Now, however, physics has become a living science. It's all dressed up in aerodynamics, in stresses and strains, and the whole amazing business of man on the wing. At this, too, Syracuse is an old hand. Even before the war, Syracuse students made use of one of the finest airports in the country. And now, with over 50,000 flying hours safely accomplished, Syracuse is indeed prepared to take its place in the post-war world of aviation. Radio broadcasting was not in our contract with the Army, but it took years to acquire these studios, to equip them, and to organize courses of study in this new and very vital art. Radio had become a part of us, and we determined it should not be sacrificed. So we continue to employ our facilities to present material of public interest. Here you see in progress the program called Syracuse on Trial, which won for us in national competition first prize among all round table programs. We continue too to offer practical training in the various phases of radio technique. They aimed at the location of Jap supply barges. This program has reached you as a public service from the radio workshop on the campus of Syracuse University. Nationally recognized is the University Theater Project. Established as a laboratory for the drama department, it provides facilities to acquaint students with acting. with stagecraft, 
with costuming, with lighting, and the many other odd departments that go to make up the theater. Some of the boys and girls you see here are serious students of the drama and intend to make it their life work. To others, the theater is a fascinating spare time activity. All are intellectually nourished by their experience and better able to live among men. Our daily paper has survived under similar conditions. With an editorial staff conspicuously short of men, we have continued to publish the Daily Orange and to offer to all who wish to learn a practical insight into the traditions, the tools, and the organization of the fourth estate. The DO has maintained its position among the top 10 college dailies in the entire country. It is the extracurricular appendage of a school of journalism whose alumni role sounds like a who's who in American letters. Important in this connection is the opportunity to actually see your work in print. It's like the thrill of playing in a fine orchestra, a large symphonic organization, alongside professional musicians, or singing with other singers. These are the things that build self-confidence and ease the transition between school and work. These musical organizations are an established part of the cultural life of the community. They are sponsored by the first fine arts college in the country, the first to award degrees in music and painting. The principal business of the School of Education is to provide the state with capable teachers. But it is also pertinent to examine and exploit new tools in pedagogy. To that end, Syracuse in 1937 established its film library to examine, classify, and distribute educational motion pictures. It now lists over a thousand films, including this one. Perhaps the least affected by the war, the College of Home Economics is still the object of a much popular misconception. No group of homely maids milling over a cook stove, Home Ec includes many fascinating classes, practical things like furniture finishing and remodeling. Can you read a gas or electric meter? Are you able to fix a leaky faucet? This girl is engaged in vitamin research. Here you see thermocouples being used to determine the exact temperature in the center of a can of beans. This setup makes it possible to examine the nitrogen content of various brands of flour. And these tricky gadgets are used to accurately measure the relative softness and tenderness of cakes. Do we have fun in wartime? Yes, we certainly do for snow is not a strategic material. Of course, this ski class would normally be larger and more masculine, but not more decorative. In February, we held our annual winter carnival. A few chivalrous males turned out to haul snow, but primarily it was a co-ed show. And the feminine viewpoint is quite definitely reflected in the subjects we find sculptured in the snow.
Traditionally, the moving up day at Syracuse, May 1st, has for years been ushered in by mounted heralds and a breakfast on the Yates Castle grounds. Later in the day, appropriate ceremonies take care of crowning the May Queen. In wartime, however, May Day turns up on the 1st of April. The traditional breakfast and the crowning of the Queen are held indoors, and the moving up day parade is made notable by a total absence of gasoline-drawn vehicles. Let's look back again, this time to 1938. In back of Krauss College, the annual flower rush is in progress. Sophomores defend the hill with a fire hose, and freshmen, armed with bags of flour, charge up the hill. to think that these games were pretty rough, but in 1943, we were directed by the Army to build a commando course, to toughen them up, give them exercise. Obviously, we've been conditioning men for competition and combat all the time. By the way, that concrete structure you see in the background, that's Archbold Stadium. It was, of course, inevitable that our athletic program should suffer in wartime. But it did sadden us to see this vast structure standing stark naked on a beautiful autumn Saturday afternoon, especially when we thought of those Saturdays in happier times, the din of horse crowds, the band marching down the field, those grand boys who trimmed Cornell in 1938 when the experts said it couldn't be done. That thing fades back, throws one to Allen, and Cornell is toppled from the football heights, 19 to 17. Just five years later, every last man on that team was in uniform, playing a bigger game, and playing for keeps. <laughs> came May 1944. The war was not over, but the Army had reached its ordained strength. The 65th College Training Detachment was disbanded, and Syracuse reverted to its own. We were ready once more to apply our men, our machines, and our masonry to the primate purpose of our being. And so today, with the help and goodwill of a host of loyal alumni and friends, we will extirpate every obstruction to a glorious future. And we will, by the grace of God, continue to exert an ever-broadening influence upon the artistic, the cultural, and the secular life of this nation.